blij dat je haar hebt. Welcome to the sixth lecture in the series on electrification and automation. Electrification is, of course, about the change in the pro propulsion system in a vehicle, typically from internal combustion engine to hybrid, plug-in hybrid, or battery electric vehicle. And there's a lot, there's been tremendous discussion about this in, in recent years. And increasingly, people believe that electrification needs to be coupled to automation and shared mobility in order to really contribute to a significant change in uh, CO2 emissions and uh, wider sustainability in transport. And that's why uh, a number of academics in the US, including your new member of staff, Giovanni Sarsella, have been writing a lot about what they call the three revolutions. Dan Sperling is the, 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 main, uh, um, the main academic behind this and has sort of made this argument that these three need to, be, need to be linked. And electrification needs to be coupled to automation, which is about, you could say, the increased dominance of, technologi of technology in the performance of transport-related tasks, such as parking and driving increasingly in real time coordinated with other artifacts in vehicles and physical infrastructures for transport. Shared mobility is um, quite an interesting way in which it is defined here. Actually, this, this figure is from the website of UC Davis, Institute for Transport Studies, where um, Dan Sperling and, and Sella are, are based. And I think you can see that this is sort of an American framing of the issue because when they talk about shared mobility, they also talk about public transport, whereas probably in Europe we would sort of see that differently. We would separate out shared mobility from public transport. Also, the fact that they associate electrification solely with vehicles is, I think, in quite a North American framing. In uh, the UK and in Europe, we would also use the term electrification for the switch or to a different propulsion system on bikes, for instance. So from push bikes to electric, vehicle, uh, electric bikes, and we see the same with, with scooters. And the, the team at UC Davis has 
published a quite influential report in 2017 where they demonstrate what the benefits might be of a switch to uh, the three revolutions. So what you see here is a, uh, the out a summary of the outcome of, of, of a modeling exercise where they got a business as usual scenario which is very similar to what we see at the moment. We have two, rev two R, two revolutions is electrification and automation and the, th the three R is adding the, um, the shared mobility to it. And you can see that in all parts of the world you see a significant increase in the, the green bars and the, uh, the, the purplish ones which are sort of uh, shared vehicles and, and bicycles. Very optimistic picture and quite a strong narrative. I think it can be perhaps criticized in a number of ways that there are other uh, um, representations of the potential benefits. Uh, this is one from a recent paper in um, Annual Reviews of Environment and Resources. I apologize for the, for the size. When I was preparing this figure, I, was, I still had the big screen in the, uh, in the other room in mind, uh, but I hope what you can see is that this too is talking about uh, um, automation, electrification and, and sharing together. They provide a more nuanced picture. Uh, there are some concerns articulated in the text. For instance, for electrification, uh, it's important to think about well-to-wheel emissions, the issues of anxiety around charging and range, and there are implications for the grids. For automation, we see that an, an increasing number of, uh, of, of academics now expect longer distances being traveled, people spending more time in vehicles uh, because they don't have to drive, they can use the time in different ways. There's, uh, there's been a number of studies that have, have argued this. Um, there's also the concern about empty cars driving around and um, there's an interesting point also about city-based air travel, drones and flying taxis in particular. But this figure too shows that the biggest benefits will occur at the nexus of electrification, automation and sharing in, in, this sort of, uh, in, in the center of the diagram. Where, yes, we may have more VMT, more miles traveled, but they will be cleaner so that you get lower emissions less air pollution, less noise pollution, possibly fewer vehicles. What this shows, this diagram, and also the work of the, of the ITS at, at UC Davis, is when we think about the future of transport, is what is going to be the backbone of the transport model? Does it remain individually, individual vehicles, or are we seeing a shift towards shared mobility public transport included as, as the, 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 uh, the main axes of, of the future transport and system. And I think that's where a lot of the debate is uh, focusing on at the moment. And I think there are people who are more optimistic about a shift towards shared mobility and there's people who are um, leaning towards more of the same of what we've already got. So clearly there are many benefits from a climate mitigation perspective from electrification, automation and sharing, which is why I want to talk about EVs and AVs, electric vehicles, automated vehicles, this hour and we'll talk more about the sharing next hour in, in connection to platformization. And the central argument I want to make this morning is that there's a lot of academic research on the future inequalities current inequalities in access to and use of electric vehicles and to a lesser extent automated vehicles, which I think is great and important, but we need to be reflexive about whether or not all these inequalities are necessarily unfair and whether we may need to think about justice in a broader sense beyond this focus on, on inequalities in access and use. There are other aspects. So this goes back to some of the things I've been talking about previously that we need this broad pluralistic conception of justice. Particularly when we think about uh, the transition uh, 
uh, towards a sustainable mobility system. Now, this is a figure from the UK, where after decades of talk about the potential from electric vehicles, we see things finally happening. Um, we, we, a positive in interpretation of what we're seeing here is that if you think about innovation adoption as following an S-curve, we're now sort of at the inflection point at the bottom of the diagram. And if we were to locate that in time, we would probably say uh, in a few years' time that it's around 2019. And for the UK specifically, this is partly because the, uh, with the pandemic, the lockdowns, the, uh, the, the figures of new internal combustion engines vehicles being sold really plummeted. That market collapsed, collapsed completely. And electric vehicles, particularly battery, vehicle, battery electric, kind of in, uh, remained steady at first and quite rapidly uh, sort of increased later on. So we see that in terms of percentage, you see this sort of very strong trajectory. And the latest figures for, I think, the fourth quarter of, of 2021 were that about 20 to 25 percent of new vehicles were battery electric and plug-in hybrid. So things are really moving, which is, I think is a good, good uh, sign. At the same time, we need to be cautious because we know new vehicles stay on the road roughly on average for about 15 to 17 years before they are either going to the scrap heap or more likely are being sold and sort of moved abroad. Uh, when the UK was part of the EU, most of, that, most of those vehicles would end up in Eastern Europe. Nowadays, we, it's, it's not entirely clear how that will work. Uh, some of them will end up in Africa, but the African countries are also sort of tightening their, uh, their, their, their legislation around the import of vehicles, which I think is a good point because from a carbon accounting point of view, it's sort of really good to have vehicles exported because they don't count for your account. But of course, if you talk about a global account, they're still operating and, and still contributing to, to emissions. We need to be careful. The market for used vehicles is still tiny in the UK. I wasn't able to find similar figures for Belgium or for Flanders, but I, I would expect it's a little bit better, but not, not much. And if you think that, yeah, about half a percent of vehicles is um, a battery electric one and that's probably an, uh, an overestimate because I think many uh, there's, there's quite a few second-hand purchases that are not taken into account in the official statistics I think there's still a lot uh, a lot of work to be done and this is also important from a equity point of view because we know that lower income groups are disproportionately dependent on the second-hand vehicle market. So if we're talking about inequalities in relation to electric or, autonom or, or automated vehicles, the situation can quite quickly become quite complex because we can think of many different indicators, we can think of many different bases for comparison. Usually, in terms of in indicators, we're looking at ownership or access, sometimes at use as well, but you can also think about skills, you can think about familiarity, you can think about attitudes. And to make things more complex, you can think about vehicle acquisition, about use and about charging in the context of electric vehicles. And I use the, the slightly awkward term acquisition because in reality, most people, certainly in the UK, don't properly own their vehicles anymore because the majority of them are leased. And I think particularly battery electric vehicles, many of them are on a lease contract because people, it's a way of people to not lock themselves into a particular technology. They just want to see how this market is going to evolve going forward. So they, they, they commit to a contract for three years and then can reevaluate what their next move is going to be. When you think about the basis for comparison, you can think about social variables, socioeconomic status, gender, race, ethnicity, uh, the extent to which you drive a car. You can also think about spatial indic indicators, different areas, different scales, neighborhoods, city, regions, countries, and so on. This figure is from a survey we did about two years ago 
uh, is a representative survey of about 2,000 uh, car owners in Great Britain, and it shows a range of different inequalities according to income. Quite clearly, sort of an owning and leasing of, of uh, uh, an electric vehicle in driving, in being in an electric vehicle, knowing someone, but also being exposed to electric vehicles. Have seen EVs in my neighborhood, and finally, I'm interested in, in electric vehicles and actually have looked up, um, looked up information. I was quite surprised when I saw this. I think quite stark inequalities. They will have perhaps changed a little bit in the last two years, but I think the overall pattern is still there. And we see some more uh, uh, inequalities also in, uh, in, in people's attitudes and, and, uh, and views. So on the left hand side, you see strong personal obligation to buy or lease an electric vehicle for your next vehicle. And people who are important to me expect me to have an electric vehicle as my next vehicle. For those of you familiar with the theory of planned behavior, these are typically, typically the kind of statements, the items that you would include in that, and that's what this is based on. We did an, we're sort of conducting a, a, a theory of planned behavior analysis using these variables, and income does play a role in that. But it's not just income, it's also gender. We see uh, women, uh, uh, sort of having slightly more range anxiety on the right hand side. Be mindful it goes up to 80, but about 80, uh, about 75% of, 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 of women say that they would always worry about running out of charge when driving an electric vehicle. And uh, they, about 65 to 70% says, I wouldn't know how to charge an EV near my home. So. Range anxieties, charging anxieties do exist. Um, now, we can talk about the, re the reasons for that, but I think they are uh, issues that need to be taken into account, and there are income and gender dimensions to this. In terms of spatial inequalities, this is a uh, somewhat clunky map from, for Bristol. As we've, uh, we're doing a study at the moment around inclusive transition to electric mobility, not just vehicles, but also um, e-scooters and other forms of transport. And uh, this is about public EV charging, and you can very clearly see a concentration around the center. And other than that, they're all in high income areas. And the big area in the middle, sort of uh, on the right hand side, that a charging desert, you could say, public charging desert, those are uh, in lower income areas. So we see sort of some of these inequalities being that exist in cities being reproduced in and through this infrastructure. What about autonomous vehicles? Different survey, same year, uh, uh, sort of about 1,100 people. Uh, and, and we created an index of familiarity with terminology around autonomous vehicles. There's little point in asking people about their actual experience of these vehicles because there's so few people who've actually been in them. So we asked them to uh, how familiar they were with six different terms that are being used. Connected and automated vehicle, autonomous vehicle, automated vehicle, driverless vehicle, self-driving vehicle, and robotic vehicle. And the box plots show, again, clear gender differences. Income is somewhat unclear, but there is a, a somewhat of a relationship that the highest income categories know more about these vehicles. And there, is, there are also some spatial differences. If you look within England, you see quite clearly London coming out significantly stronger than um, England, uh, sort of the rest of England. Why Wales is scoring so high is beyond me, uh, and it's something we need to look into further, but I think, yeah, the, the, the figures for England are, are certainly interested. So many, ex many inequalities exist, but we need to ask, are they also necessarily unfair? And I think the, question, the, the answer to that is n no, because we know that innovation processes are socially and spatially uneven, and many of these inequalities may be temporary. 
We also know, as I was talking about yesterday, what we need to make a distinction between inequalities in opportunities and inequalities in outcomes. Um, so this sort of requires a little bit further thinking. And actually, it is useful to go back to Rogers' classic innovation diffusion model, the S-curve, where you've got these different segments that he calls the innovators, the early adopters, early majority, late majority, and the laggards. And of course, you will have seen that this is a neat normal distribution. And then we're talking about one and two standard deviations from that, um, fr from the, the, the average. I would say that unfairness, we, we, we can say that some of these inequalities are unfair when there are very strong associations between innovativeness and social class, gender, race, age, disability, and its intersections. And we see these kinds of persist throughout all these segments in the population. So if, if even amongst the late majority in the laggards, we see these kinds of associations. I think we're in a bit, we're, we're kind of getting towards a point where these inequalities are becoming structural and will probably not, um, not uh, d dissolve with the further evolution of the process. All of this may be even stronger if the diffusion stops before the completion. So it's quite possible and, and with many technological innovations, we don't get through the whole curve and we stop somewhere in the early majorities or late majorities. So, so again, there are issues there that we need to take into account. In terms of the um, opportunity of outcome, sorry, inequality in opportunity versus inequality in outcome. Yesterday I spoke about capabilities as a way of assessing inequalities in, in opportunity and I already showed you this graph and I talked already about the issues of, of, of using a public charging infrastructure. And again, if we are seeing that there are structural inequalities in the capability to charge or to drive an electric vehicle, then we are in a bit of bother and there is perhaps a, a sort of a, a strong reason for some kind of intervention. What about autonomous vehicles? All quite unclear. There's a lot of literature being produced and that provides quite different outcomes, I would say. And uh, this paper was published uh, late last year in sustainability and provides a really neat overview of, of some of the key findings of that literature. It focuses on accessibility, which as I explained yesterday, is a quite coarse but still useful indicator of opportunity um, of, and, and this can tell us something about inequalities in opportunity. And accessibility here is understood as the extent to which land use and transport systems enable individuals or groups of individuals to reach activities or destinations by means of various transport modes. And what you see is that the authors make a distinction between accessibility impacts in space and uh, according to social group. And uh, I think particularly the accessibility polarization is of interest where it can go different ways. Some studies suggest that the, 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 uh, the inequalities will be of such nature that the cities will disproportionately benefit and the suburbs and rural areas will be lagging behind. Other studies say exactly the opposite. Uh, and I think there are reasons for sort of plausible arguments for both set of relations. It's a classic case where we simply had lack the information and there is sort of fundamental uncertainty about how this will uh, continue and how this will evolve in the future. Um, I don't think there will be one answer. It may very well be that in certain cities, in certain geographical contexts, we see benefits concentrated in cities. Elsewhere, we'll see them um, emerge in, in suburbs and, 
and rural areas. So this is very much an area of debate at the moment, and it's kind of an, an, a question of wait and see how things will go on from here. Something similar is going on with the, uh, the inequalities across social groups. Some studies say uh, we will see more inequalities along uh, the classic social uh, identification markers. Others say we will actually see reduced inequality because the benefits will disproportionately arrive or will dif disproportionately accrue to for instance, older people, people with a disability, children, groups whose accessibility is uh, usually smaller. Again, it's a, it's a, uh, it, it's a case of, of wait and see what will, what will happen. Um, but I would say that we should seriously consider the possibility that this technology reinforces inequalities that we already see within mobility systems. So if we reflect on that literature on, on inequalities in relation to electric and autonomous vehicle, then I think it's quite clear that we see a strong focus on what I previously called distributional justice. And uh, in the first lecture, I showed you this slide where I sort of outlined this critical pluralist understanding of justice, where distribution and the distribution of benefits and costs and risks is one important uh, element, but we also need to look at procedural justice, which is about the nature of decision-making and governance, and about recognition, which is the acknowledgement and respect for the rights, values, needs, habits of particular groups and particular individuals. So in the literature on electric and autonomous vehicles, we see sort of that very strong focus on distribution. I think that literature is also very strongly focused on the global north and China, um, and other parts of the world remain quite uh, sort of are not given due attention. And I would say that the emphasis of that literature is very much on questions of access and use in the here or and now and possibly the, the, the near future, but much less about the broader chains of events and processes through which electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles are produced and used and, and get disposed of. Uh, so so we, I think we need to think much more about global value change, chains in, in, in this context. I would also say that the methods and methodologies that are being used in this literature are quite limited, quite limited in the extent that uh, if, if you think from that perspective of that pluralist understanding of justice, much of the literature is about surveys and uh, some, some government data, but the kind of data that I showed you with surveys is, is kind of the, the main uh, way of, of looking at these questions. I think there's much broader scope for a, a wider range of qualitative methods um, for, for exploring these kinds of issues going forward. There is a literature, a small literature, a small body of work that, that offers a, 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 a broader range, a broader perspective on questions of justice in relation to electric vehicles, much less in relation to autonomous vehicles. I've just put up four examples uh, in, on, on this slide. The work of Jason Henderson, which was published a couple of years ago in the Annals of the uh, American Association of Geographers, I think, is an excellent piece that sort of really adopts a, a wide-ranging view on questions of, of justice. Benjamin Sovacol has done a range of studies, and I think the, the, the paper at the bottom right, which has just come out in, in Mobilities, is very interesting because it looks at some of the political economic aspects of uh, mobility justice in relation to electric vehicles in a context, Germany, that of course is very, has a very strong uh, uh, car system and a very strong lobby also politically and a, b because of the strong car industry. So what this small body of literature does is that it, it draws attention to the need for thinking about, uh, about 
distributional justice in a broader sense. So it begins to think about biographies from battery production all the way to vehicle disposal. So we see all activities from mining to the afterlife of the, of, of the battery being taken into account. There is recognition of the historical depth in all of this, that automobility came into existence in, in the global north and that the, there may be questions about retributive justice going forward and that we need to think about aspects of distribution that are not necessarily with not necessarily compatible with automobility and the questions of transport poverty. And I think the, the paper by Tobias Haas is, is really nice in, in that regard because it draws attention to the ways in which in the German discourse about equality and, and, and equity in relation to electric vehicles, there's no mention whatsoever of people who simply cannot afford to drive or are unable to drive for various reasons and who are sort of in a, in a position of transport poverty. Which brings us to the importance of thinking about recognition and about structures of domination, as I talked about in one of the earlier lectures, uh, that constrain the capabilities of to, to become mobile for those who would not be using a car in, uh, in, in car-dominated geographical context, and who are negatively affected by the production and disposal of electric vehicles. So what's happening around the, uh, the cobalt mining, the lithium mining, the, the geopolitics of that, the, uh, the, the um, economic development around mining, which takes place in rural areas, as I mentioned before, all of these kinds of issues need to be taken into account. That also means we need to think about procedure, procedural justice, uh, because some of the policy around electric vehicle can be argued is unfair, if not elitist. Uh, I think EV uh, subsidy policy is, is a good example in many countries that uh, the, the the, the innovators, the, uh, the, the first adopters, have been able to benefit from some of the subsidies by government. And now that we see uh, the adoption move to the curve and was sort of coming towards a stage where more of the majority, the, er the, the early majority is going to adopt these vehicles, which tends to have slightly lower incomes, we see that these subsidies are being, uh, being reduced, if not completely taken out. So that raises a number of questions about who has benefited most from these subsidies. And uh, there's also a question of who is able to influence and participate in, in policies. And uh, that literature shows that it effectively in all contexts currently being studied, marginalized constitu constituents are effectively excluded from the policy making process. And just to reiterate how important it is to think about justice in relation to electric vehicle, this is from the introduction of the decarbonizing transport plan in the UK, which is now the, the, uh, the, the current government's definitive statement about the future of transport, the future of local transport in particular, and there's this very strong focus on effectively business as usual. We're going for a technological substitution trajectory where we just continue to do what we've always done. We just swap some of the, um, some of the technologies in that. So in this document, which perhaps was to be expected, you find very little attention to questions of justice and, and who should be supported and in what way. And if we're really serious about this, tra this, this uh, um, trajectory, this transition trajectory that we've talked about before, then we do need this critical pluralist understanding of justice and need to look at all these dimensions. So what, I've, what I'm beginning to do at this slide is to identify some of the elements regarding the governance of just transformation. And I will return to the contents of this slide in following lectures and then sort of bring everything together in the final lectures, the final lecture of the series. I would say that three elements 
are critical to this, this just transformation. Uh, firstly, it's about the development of shared imaginaries, visions, and planning approaches that are, ex that are inclusive. So it's really about that broad and inclusive dialogue and visioning, um, which focuses on the role of electric vehicles in mobility systems and what kind of role we would want these vehicles to play. We need to think about the consequences of electric vehicle and automated electric vehicle production use and afterlife, not only in the places that, in, in the jurisdiction of a particular government, but sort of thinking that in, in terms of these broader networks and uh, uh, sort of spatially and also Temporal, temporally, so we need to think much more about the intergenerational justice uh, aspects as well. Which will then hopefully lead to a different way of, of uh, formulating policy. It's also important, and this is the second element, to think about experimentation and make sure that that becomes inclusive with proper monitoring and evaluation centered on questions of epistemic justice, and I will say a little bit about that uh, in, in a second. And the third element is that we think about how we're going to scale the outcomes of, ex of experiments. There's often in the literature on governance, transition governance, a lot of emphasis on experimentation, and then sometimes it stops, but experimentation is really only the first stage because you will have to do things afterwards to, to make sure that these, these transition pr processes continue because the idea that at some point the market will take care of this and will, will organize these kinds of things often turns out not to be quite true in the transport context. On experimentation, I think this notion of inclusivity is particularly important. Um, together with my colleague Debbie Hopkins, we did a project on experimentation in the UK, both at national and local level, and we published this, this chapter in a book in 2018, where we uh, argued that the real-world character of urban experiments with connected and automated vehicles is effectively an artifact because what is happening is that the idea of the city in these experiments is actually a highly selective and sanitized understanding. It's a very, a very sheltered understanding of the city and what both of these quotes on the, uh, on the slide show is that there was very limited participation of the public in these kinds of experiments. So there's a lot of talk about how important it is to engage with the public, but actually that is very limited for a, a number of different reasons. Some of it has to do with risk management, and I, I understand that, uh, but some of also is, is also because uh, there is a very strong sense that these experiments cannot fail. They are not allowed to fail. Failure is simply not on the cards. Not least because in the UK, the government has put a lot of emphasis on automated vehicles. Automated vehicle industry uh, is, is seen as key to the industrial strategy of Britain after Brexit and after the global financial crisis. There's a broad sense that in Britain, people need to, uh, we need to make more things. We need to move away from financial services. We need to have a stronger industrial base and automated vehicles, connected automated electric vehicles are seen as one of the key areas where that industrial base needs to be developed again. So there are big political stakes in these experiments. And I think you see similar things in other countries. It's different for countries with a, with, where there's very little or no car industry and where the 
process of deindustrialization, reindustrialization has a different dynamic, but for the UK it's very clear that uh, there is this strong focus on, on, on this industry becoming a success. So political economy plays a profound role in how these processes are evolving. We also did a, we were involved, and we being the Transport Studies Unit in Oxford, in a experiment with public charging infrastructure in Oxford. What you see here is a map of Oxford. Oxford is a smallish city, 150,000 inhabitants or so, um, where the city government got some money from national government to do an experiment with five different types of on-street chargers, which you see on the pictures on the sides. One is a lamppost charger, then there are three bollards that kind of get placed on the curb side. And the final one is a charger that is attached to people's property, and then they get a cable gully through the pavement to avoid cables lying around and people uh, sort of, and, and reducing the trip hazard. It was meant to be an experiment for a year. It became an experiment for, uh, for, for, for about two and a half years in total because of various delays. Um, and we did the monitoring and evaluation in this project where together with um, two colleagues, we uh, had the 30 participants in the trial uh, participate in, in four moments of data collection. So it was a longitudinal study where we interviewed them at four points before the trial, right after they had received the charger close to their home in, in, uh, on the streets, after about six months and then after, at the end of the year. And just see how they became, uh, um, how they adopted that charger in their daily routine, how, they, how their habits adjusted to this, um, how their parking behaviors changed. And actually most of the changes we found were actually in, in the parking. The reason I want to talk about this experiment here is that I think it is actually a example of quite an inclusive experiment where the monitoring and the evaluation was centered on questions of epistemic justice. And, and remember previously I talked about it as a I talked about epistemic justice as having two legs. On the one hand, there is testimonial justice, which means that people are given the opportunity for their voice to be heard. And then there is hermeneutical justice, which is then ad adapting your knowledge production process in such a way that it can actually deal and properly respond to the information that these voices articulate. And we did that in this project by essentially uh, developing a very bottom-up approach to understanding what successful performance of this uh, charging infrastructure was. Part of this was born out of necessity because uh, we did a, an extensive trawl of the literature, but there is really no framework for understanding what a, successfully perf what a successful uh, piece of charging infrastructure in the public realm means. And uh, what we did was sort of use these qualitative methods, so interviews, ethnography, we, we videoed people at two different points in time to see how they were actually charging their, um, their vehicle to understand some of the the non-verbalized routines and habits and the skills. Remember yesterday I talked about practice theory with these three elements and one of them was about, was about skills. So we, we tried to do that through video ethnography. And we engaged ultimately not just with the trial participants, the users, but also with the, uh, the private sector. So the, 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 the companies responsible for operating and providing the, the, the equipment and uh, local government. Um, and I think what we, what we came up with was a series of criteria for performance that sort of emerged from this very qualitative process, very bottom up 
which on the side of users is about the things you see here. It's about ease of access, ease of use. It's about thinking how that piece of kit is integrated in the wider streetscape. Thinking about questions of robustness, a lot, quite a few of these uh, pieces of equipment failed at some point, either because wear and tear, there was a lot of vandalism, uh, part of which was very interestingly, well, we're not, we weren't sure, but it seemed to be caused by um, people who sort of believed that electrification was not the right way to go for Oxford as a city moving towards sustainable transports. Um, there are questions about billing, there are questions about speed of charging. If you think about it in this way with hindsight, it, yeah, you think, okay, this makes a lot of sense. Um, but it sort of, yeah, emerged from this, from this process as a set of criteria. And then on the side of the charging providers, this, the, the installation providers, there are questions about utilization, there are questions about adoption capacity, and this is particularly important because residents want to be able to charge at any time that they would like. So they want to have first right of that piece of kit in their street and almost sort of feel they have some kind of right to it. But if you want to ex sort of operate this commercially, that will never ever get you enough of uh, charging activity to make this even, even vaguely uh, um, uh, profitable. And you need at least, I think at least three charges. Depends a little bit on, on the piece of kit, but uh, there are pieces where, you, where, where people say that you need about three charging episodes uh, in, in a 24 hour circle, cycle. So how can you, how can you negotiate that commercial incentive with the incentive of the, 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 the sense of entitlement that the, re, the, the, uh, the residents um, experience. There are questions about the business case. Actually, in our study, we came to the conclusion that for charging installations, really at individual parking base, there is very little of a business case. It's not so much the installation as such, but it's more the work that needs to be done to connect it to the grid, which also plays out that in, in Oxford, not the, 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 uh, the, the grid structure is not mapped everywhere precisely. So basically they don't know where the cables are. So there were instances where they just dug the hole on the, right, on the wrong side of the street. So you can imagine what that kind of, what the cost that that involves. There were, there were installations, individual installations that cost about 10,000 pounds all in. And it's very difficult to justify that if you think about scaling this to the level of a, of a whole city. So some people believe that we need to look at other types of uh, charging, public charging uh, um, options going, going forward. There were also questions of complaints by neighbors uh, who had a range of different uh, uh, objections they raised to the council who was ultimately uh, responsible for all this. So a bit of a mixed bag, but I've, I think the point I'll try to make here is that we would not have been able to identify all these issues had we not gone through this process in which testimonial justice played uh, such, a, such a significant role. So I think there's, there's potential there for developing this further in future research. But in thinking about the design of infrastructure, we also need to think about what currently gets designed and what we currently know about this is mostly or at least largely based on what early adopters think and want. Which brings us to the question about how we can define, how can we develop systems, infrastructures, that are also serving the needs and issues and concerns of subsequent segments of uh, EV 
uses in this case. So I would say uh, we need to think about this in, in terms of an infrastructural justice sense where we create infrastructures that also recognize the needs of future users. So this is not quite intergenerational justice. It's also not fully intragenerational justice. It sits somewhere halfway. And just to, to, to emphasize this point about uh, the importance of div designing infrastructures and, and policies for the wider population of future EV users. Uh, this is a, a graph from, from a study by um, a, a, a team in, in, in the Nordic countries where they have uh, looked at, they've done a big survey across five countries uh, f including Finland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Iceland, uh, where they had about 5,000 respondents, did a cluster analysis to identify segments in, in, the, in the population of future EV users. And if you sort of look at where people have actually adopted EV so far, it's quite strongly that status seeker segment in, in the... Um, in the middle, which is not exclusively, but is, has sort of disproportionate number of men who work in the private sector on quite a high salary. And the, the argument in this paper is, is that the early majority would be constituted by the, the segments of the greens, the public mobiles, and the blue column moderates. Um, and they have quite different concerns, not least of, one, of, uh, not, not least of all uh, price. Uh, they're quite price sensitive concerns. They, are mo they, they have more young people, they have more women, they have more highly educated people. And of course, the blue collar moderates are uh, sort of lower, indi lower, indi uh, lower education and uh, working in, in, in more precarious types of, of, of labor. So again, the point here is that mobility justice in transition trajectories needs temporal thickness. It needs to think about time as much as about space. So coming to a conclusion, the three takeaway messages as in earlier lectures, we see that electrification and automation raise many and quite profound questions about distributional justice. Very important for the academic literature to focus on this, but equally important that we work with broader understandings of justice that take into account the multiple dimensions. And think about this temporal thickness that I ended on, because what we now see is sort of really the early adopters. And the final point is that electrification and autification needs to be linked to the question of shared mobility. And I will return to this in the next lecture on platforms. Thank you very much. And that's the end of the lecture.
Welcome to the seventh lecture in the series on platformization. This is a picture I took in Liverpool just after Christmas this year. And I took it because it captures three generations of platform-enabled shared mobility in one, in one shot. You see, the, well, you see the remnants of the docked bikes that were operated by the firm Nextbike between roughly 2014-2017 on behalf of the local government. Those bikes are now gone because you can only see the docking stations, the, the green boards and the, uh, the, 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 the iron structure, which was the, the, the station that was used for, to, to dock the bikes. And you, you see them all over central Liverpool um, as, as remnants of this, of this scheme. You also see a docked e-bike with the yellow handles, very few in number, but still operational. And uh, if I understood it correctly, they were a response to the mobile style of operation of dockless bikes that we've seen in so many British cities and also, of course, here on the, on the continent. And you see the red e-scooters by Boy. E-scooters are in a p peculiar situation in the UK because they're a, they are legally not allowed on the road. They're illegal. And it was only during the pandemic that there was a strong call for sort of experiments for uh, using them. And uh, a national trial was set up across about 20 cities in 2020. And Liverpool was one of them. And Whereas in other cities, they are quite strongly dispersed across the city. In Liverpool, they were really, you could really find most of them around these old docking stations. To me, this picture is, symbolizes the volatility of developments in platform mobilities in the UK context, all of which are premised on processes of Datafication. Well, we're talking more broadly about the digitalization of transportation services and vehicle technology, which have all kinds of implications for the production of space, where digitalization primarily entails datafication and algorithmization. Datafication is the increasing mediation of and dependence on digital data in the operation, governing, and use of transportation systems. Algorithmization is the growing reliance on artificial intelligence for dynamic algorithms for the operation and governance of transport. And these two processes of datafication and algorithmization underpin automation and platformization. We've talked about automation in the previous lecture. Today, this hour, the focus is on platformization, which refers to the increased role of digital platforms in matching transportation demand and supply, and ride hailing, car sharing services, meal delivery, plat uh, meal delivery services, and platforms through which freight operators and drivers can find customers are all examples of this. And this hour, I want to talk about three themes. I want to talk about developments and pathways in platformization, which can go quite fast. I want to talk about the labor implications, and I want to talk about justice in relation to platformization. In terms of pathways, there's a really interesting piece by John Stalin and colleagues that was published two years ago in Environment and Planning A, where they offer a typology of platformization in transport, transport services. This is pre-COVID. Um, things may have changed slightly, but I think the, the, the overall structure of the typology would still be um, accurate for where we are at the moment. They first of all identified what they call networked accumulation, which uh, is about private firms exploiting existing mobility gaps by 
appropriating existing informal mobility practice and underutilized assets and do so by introducing new vehicles into urban space. So classic examples would be Uber, Lyft, Bird, Grab, and, and also Voy, for instance. Secondly, infrastructural thickening is about incumbent large infrastructure firms expanding into mobility services to complement what they already do. Think about companies like Nederlandse Spoorwegen, or Deutsche Bahn, who have ventured into first and last mile solutions, for instance, by offering various bike sharing services. Then there is what Stalin and colleagues call life extension. It's essentially about incumbent automobility firms investing in shared vehicle fleets as an exit strategy from declining auto sales and in preparation for the arrival of robo-taxis. So think BMW and its Drive Now scheme, Daimler-Benz and its Car2Go scheme, both of which are now uh, merged into ShareNow as, as a service and other big car manufacturers have, have sort of set up similar schemes and services. Governmental fix is about state agencies and civil society non-profit organizations trying to promote social values and local economic competitiveness. So this can be cities, regional authorities, and the EU also plays a role in this. And, and perhaps the best example of this is the mobility as a service scheme that has been developed by Mars Global in Helsinki known as WIM. But there, again, there are others. Commoning, finally, is about the formation of platforms for peer-to-peer -peer services, sometimes in reaction to the market power of large platforms. So Ride Austin is an example of this, was set up in the city of Austin in um, Texas, partially in response to the operation of, of um, Uber, and functioned on a not-for-profit basis for some time. And then in, in the end, it was sort of, um, it, it disappeared again. But interestingly, the data produced by the vehicles is in the public domain. And there are quite a few studies, travel behavior studies, that use this data to understand some of the dynamics in, um, in ride sharing. So many different ways in which platform is taking place. And it's fair to say that of those forms, networked accumulation has received the most attention in the academic literature. And I think that's not without reason, because Uber and Lyft in particular have reconfigured how transport professionals and, and researchers think about service provision. Of course, we should also look at other providers, think Didi in, in China, Bolt, Taxify, Gojek, Grab. There's a range of more local schemes as well in, in various parts of the world, for instance, in, in Africa. I want to focus here on Grab in Southeast Asia. And it's the, the studied in detail by a PhD student in Oxford, who I have the, the privilege to supervise, Nina Tang, and the figure here is, is sort of drawn from one of the papers that she's, uh, that she's preparing as part of her, part of her uh, dissertation. And I will sort of talk a little bit more about the, the competition, the quite fierce competition between these various operators in a, in a minute. But before I do that, I think it's really useful to go to what is known as the multi-level perspective, which is about system change in mobility, in food, in energy, in housing, any sector you can think of. And the idea here is that system change or regime change is quite rare, it will happen only at particular points in time. And it happens when there are suitable alternatives available, when innovations have been developed that have become mature and are able to compete with that regime. So that's what you see at the bottom end. 
And when there are wider developments that weaken the regime, and that's what's here denoted as the social technical landscape. So broader developments over which actors in the regime have little or no influence weaken that regime. And examples would be, at the moment, of course, the discourse around climate, uh, the, the climate crisis, the pandemic, uh, the global financial crisis, which has put a lot of strain on things. Uh, young people increasingly less interested in cars and perhaps more interested in digital technologies. The whole rise of digital technologies more generally, these kinds of broader developments putting strain on the regime of, in particular, privately owned cars. This model was developed by Frank Gales and colleagues in, in the Netherlands uh, for historical developments in uh, innovations, uh, not least the rise to dominance of the internal combustion engine powered vehicle and is now being used in a wide range of contexts by many different people. And I think this is probably one of the most popular social science diagrams of the last 15 years that you see in many different places. And uh, you can identify kind of four phases within that process. At the first, you have sort of really the emergence of innovations and niches. The second, you see maturation of these innovations. And the third, you see really the competition with the regime. And the fourth phase means the, the, the stabilization of the new regime. And those four phases actually can also be identified in the development of Grab in Southeast Asia. It emerged in about uh, around 2013 regionally in Kuala Lumpur as a collaboration with a major taxi company. The original idea for Grab was developed by two Malaysian Harvard Business School graduates who had seen Uber in, in operation when they were studying in the US. What they tried to do was to solve key local problems, low driver income and job satisfaction, and the lack of safety for female customers in particular. In Malaysia's taxi industry, which was sort of seen as one of the worst in the world. And Grab used, developed an online smartphone booking app to make booking taxi rides safer, more convenient, and the pricing more transparent. Unlike other ride-hailing companies, Grab established an in in intention to work closely with government regulators to improve the taxi industry. So the approach is quite different from what we've seen with Uber. This is very, this is much more collaborative, collaborative with drivers, collaborative with policymakers. And quite soon Grab received full endorsement from local government authorities in Malaysia. Growing was difficult at this stage because hardly any taxi driver used a smartphone in 2012 in Kuala Lumpur and wireless internet coverage was unreliable and credit card penetration very low. So again, they took a collaborative approach where they helped drivers buy a phone, taught them how to use the app and developed a workaround feature that enabled drivers to collect cash payments from passengers directly. Southeast Asia is quite suited to the introduction of ride-hailing app technology. Uh, in, in the early 2010s because of low car ownership, high population densities, high smartphone subscription growth rates, particularly in the middle and upper class populations, fast growing middle class, and a large informal urban employment sector that provides a large pipeline of potential drivers. Public transport infrastructure is limited, traffic congestion heavy, parking space very scarce, so favorable conditions for the Grab to grow rapidly. And it um, secured its first significant round of venture capital investment of more than $10 million in um, 2013. That 
allowed it to grow and uh, to start to compete with other operators in the market, especially Easy Taxi, which is, was originally from Brazil and which launched in Kuala Lumpur in 2013. Grab used actually most of that venture capital injection to outcompete Easy Taxi and to expand its services in five countries in Southeast Asia in a quick succession. And uh, Uber had also entered that market and had introduced its UberX service and kind of started to move away from supporting taxis. So UberX, as I'm sure you know, is uh, private citizens using their personal car to pick up passengers um, and sort of really, yeah, brings in a, a, a provides an enormous potential of, of would-be ride-hailing drivers. Grab competed directly with Uber by introducing its own private hire vehicle service with professional drivers and, and licensed limousines in Singapore in 2013. Easy Taxi remained focused on digital taxi hailing uh, and, and predominantly competing against Grab. So throughout 2014, you see sort of a lot of competition that intensifies and ultimately results in a price war. The startups offered lucrative cash discounts and incentives to attract users, and that meant that they were sort of burning cash, burning capital quite quickly, which was sort of not what, which was not an issue because there was a lot of buoyancy in the market and new investments, new cap venture capital continued to come in. Grab started to uh, outcompete Uber with taxi hailing services moving from Uber to Grab. And um, eventually Grab launched its own private hire vehicle hailing services with private cars in 2015 to further compete with Uber. In the meantime, Gojek had emerged in emerged in Indonesia, which was also competing. So again, there's a lot of competition um, in, in this space in Southeast Asia. And in 2015, we see that in the Philippines legalizes ride hailing. It's the first country in the world to do that, uh, despite the local taxi associations being quite heavily against this. And we see that the regulatory environment for ride hailing favors ride hailing companies over incumbent taxi operators um, in, in this period. And also Grab launched a new service, Grab Car, that became the first transport network company, TNC, in, Philippines, in the Philippines under the new law. And we see similar things happening in Indonesia, Vietnam, Singapore, and so on. So despite white losses due to the competition for market share, venture capital continues to come into the industry and was premised all on the idea that this is really a winner-takes-all market. You need to become the leading operator in a city. And interesting because Grab and Gojek were local companies that could adapt that technology, financial resources and business model to the specifics of that market, they out-innovated Uber. Competition intensified, again, uh, between the players, and uh, Gojek becomes very prominent and starts to uh, implement its GoPay system, where it's essentially uh, sort of moving away completely from cash payment system. It becomes effectively a financial service company. In 2017, in the summer, Grab received another very large round of investments, and that allowed it to become a full services financial technology platform. Uber falls behind even further, and ultimately 
in 2018. We see that uh, Uber is taken over by Grab um, in 51 cities across eight countries in Southeast Asia. And in return, Uber gets a 27.5% market share in, in Grab. And Grab sort of really became the dominant player in the region and starts to diversify its activities. Much more food delivery, uh, lots more financial activity, and it launches its super app. And the super apps is not something we see a lot of in Europe, but they are actually quite common in Africa. And this is a, a screenshot of the version of Grab from, from 2019. And the point here is that you can see that it becomes an integrated service delivery for all kinds of things you need in your everyday life, from your transport, to your food, to subscriptions, to hotel bookings, your streaming service, your tickets, everything in one, in one app. And this is sort of really where Gojek and Grab have been leading. We see similar developments in, in Asia. I think, interestingly, the Global North is lagging behind in this case, which is one of the reasons why I think it's much more interesting to look at Asia for what's happening in this space. So what we see is cross-regime interaction. Grab is no longer simply a transport company. It's a service provider that works in many different domains, all of which is underpinned by a single digital payment system. I would say now Grab is a financial services company, full stop. This process continued during the pandemic where Grab, like many other providers, adapted its, its, its services. It halted some of its ride-sharing services and moved to um, uh, much more delivery service. We've seen the same in, for instance, Pakistan, where uh, providers have switched completely from uh, transporting passengers to delivering goods, uh, not simply food to customers, but also sort of uh, more in, in a commercial setting. And I think that the speed with which these companies are able to adapt their practices is something we've never seen in transport. And I think it's very interesting to think about going forward because uh, uh, there are a number of issues, issues there. In 20... 20, Grab also decided to go public and they ultimately debuted on the Nasdaq in early December 2021. But as with Uber, performance was well below expectations and very substantial financial losses have been reported subsequently. The annual last loss of Grab for the financial year of 2021 was estimated at 3.4 billion US dollars. And that was more than the 2.6 billion in 2020. So these companies grow very, very fast. They do lots of different things, but they're also burning uh, capital at a very high rate, which makes us wonder about the sustainability of this, not only from a justice point of view, but, but broader. And actually, I think what we see here is a story of a masculine, masculinist innovation race underpinned by a winner-takes-it-all mentality and very much enabled by venture capital, which is creating a deeply unstable system where the instability is intensified by the coupling across domains. And we can wonder about the stability of the mobility system, the regime that Grab and Gojek are offering in Southeast Asia, also with a view to the future. And actually, it's helpful here to go back to the early days of Marxism and uh, Rosa Luxemburg in particular, who's written in the end of the 19th century already about how credit can sort of really make all kinds of relations within the capitalist context uh, much more fluid. And she, she writes 
as you can see here, it, it renders all capitalist forces extensible, relative, and mutually sensitive to the highest degree. It aggravates and facilitates crisis. Um, and we may see some of that happening in platform mobilities elsewhere. And I think there is, there, there is a sense that in, 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 in Southeast Asia, at least, this bubble will at some time burst. And it's unclear what that will mean because many millions of commuters and other people have become very dependent on these services. And if some of that kind of rapidly disappears, it will, we'll, we'll see quite substantial change going forward. So Grab's story is one about system change, but I haven't spoken about daily practices and experiences. There are actually many studies that have looked at user behavior and experience, especially in the global north and in China. And Tenwa's work is one of those I learned about yesterday in, uh, in the Chinese context. There is much less known about the worker side of these services. There is a literature on some of this, mostly in anthropology, but as part of a research program called Peak Urban, Lucy Baker at the T Transport Studies Unit and myself did a project on the transition to digital monies in auto rickshaw industry in Bengaluru, India. Bengaluru is known as India's smart city and, and uh, promotes itself as China's smart city and has sort of seen all kinds of experiments and initiatives to, uh, to, to uh, um, diffuse and scale up uh, smart technologies. And for this work, we've drawn on the concept of financial ecologies developed in the geographies of finance, where financial ecologies are arrangements of financial knowledge, institutions, subjectivities, and practices that exist at particular times and particular places. India has a long history of demonetization by the state, where the state has sought to shrink the informal sector, or the black economy as it's locally known, by basically taking out cash. And they've done that at different points in time. They've done that in January 46, again in 78, and in November 2016, when um, on the 16th of November, the government ordered the removal of widely used 500,000 rupee banknotes, the equivalent of five or 10 euros, you could say, from circulation and their replacement by new notes. And Modi's, Prime Minister Modi's announcement applied to more than 85% of the cash that was in circulation at the time. So this caused quite a bit of panic and turmoil in the local economy. It led, in fact, to a short-term shock to the economy, reduced interest rates and economic growth, deflation, devaluation of the rupee, increased demands for US dollars and bitcoins, and disproportionate damage to the informal economy. But the most important longer term impact has been the acceleration of the transition towards a cashless economy. The push for cashlessness was a component of Modi's Digital India program, which sought to create digital infrastructures, governance services and empowerment across multiple domains, including financial transactions. And the emergence of Ola and Uber has further enhanced the incorporation of the auto rickshaw sector in financial ecologies of cashlessness. Traditionally, potential customers hired auto rickshaws by gaining the attention of the driver who was searching for passengers in a given area of the city. But in a very short space of time, about a year, in, in 2016, we saw that the number of auto rickshaw trips booked through Ola and Uber increased up to five times across India. And of course, this whole process will only have been uh, sort of accelerated and enhanced by the, by the pandemic. And there are sort of many advantages from a customer perspective from booking an auto rickshaw through Ola 
or Uber because you don't have to haggle about the fare. You just get in, you know what you're going to pay, you leave very, very soon. And particularly for a middle class clientele who works in the IT sector, which is very large in Bengaluru, this is a particularly appealing form of service provision. Um, it's cheaper, more convenient, more reliable. And also, Ola encourages us, its consumers to, its customers to pay for trips using the Ola money e-wallet by offering rewards in the form of future trip discounts. And similarly, it has its own credit card that offers cash back on taxi trips booked through Ola and, and on other commodities. So uh, you see there are many reasons for customers to, to shift towards uh, paying with your e-wallet or, uh, or your phone. But on the driver side, this creates a number of issues because drivers, driver operators, because most of them own their own vehicle, are heavily reliant on cash. Heavily reliant on cash for a number of things. First of all, cash allows them to surcharge their drivers. There is a legal fee or a, a sort of a, a, this regulation about how much you can charge. But that is, has not been adapted over time. Costs have gone up, so it's never ever going to cover all your costs to operate your business as a driver. So there is, a, there is in that sense a, an incent, a, sort of a, a, a business incentive, if you like, for, for overcharging. Then you will have to pay for your vehicle maintenance, you will have to pay for your drinks during, uh, during breaks, socializing with your colleagues. You do that in places that are very cash dependent. You will also have to pay the traffic police. Bribes, corruption, very important because otherwise you're not going to get your place at the stand. Um, so there's a lot of money going around there. You also have to pay your money lenders. Because these drivers are not cash worthy and do not meet the credit scoring systems of the banks, the official banks, they have to rely on the traditional colonial era money lending system that is still in place, the Saitus, also known as Shroffs elsewhere in India. They are registered under regional state legislation and are part of the indigenous banking system that goes back actually to pre-colonial times. And they charge high rates of interest. And if you don't pay, they have their guys who come after you. And then there's your family, because obviously these are people who are, they are mostly male, men, particular castes, low income, uh, and they have to provide for their families, education, housing, daily uh, uh, shopping, and so on. So they argue, and these are just two of the quotes from the interviews that Lucy did, we need the cash for everyday things. And I have commitments, my car is still, my auto is still on loan, I have personal loans as well, and yeah, all these need to be paid. And getting money from ATMs is tricky because it is very expensive, in part because of this government policy towards demonetization, it has made, it's tried to make getting cash out of the machine unattractive. And uh, it only gives you a sort of large uh, banknotes, at least far larger than these people need. They may need 20 rupee on a day or so, and they get multiples of hundreds. Um, also, the transport network companies don't pay immediately. You do your rights and it may take up to a week before you get your money. And the, uh, the, the sort of, yeah, the, uh, that allows these companies to make some money of the interest. And of course the e-wallets are not always usable, particularly the places where these drivers do their shopping, do meet other people, uh, didn't accept e-wallets, at least not before the pandemic. So a bit of a tricky situation here and you could say that actually the shift towards Uber and, and, and Ola is, is disadvantaging these drivers in a number of ways.
And Lucy made a film about this for uh, using some, some money from our university to, uh, to hire a, um, a number of artists who uh, produced sort of this, this, uh, uh, this film uh, for her about auto rickshaw drivers and, and the, the, the situation they, uh, the difficult situations they find themselves in, in uh, on an everyday basis. And this was explicitly meant for uh, dissemination in India where there's lot of, lots of prejudice against these, these drivers. And I, um, I think it's a really nice product and, and I would encourage you to look, at, to look, up the, uh, look it up on, on YouTube. You can find it on the TSU website. So we begin to see a number of justice considerations here on the user side, on the driver side, and also on the side of people who do not use these services. So there are questions for users about access, questions about affordability, questions about interactions with drivers and fellow customers during the trip, before the trip, and after the trip. And if I had more time, I would talk about some of the other work that Nina has done uh, on what happens within ride-sharing services, how they effectively are microcosms of some of the social tensions uh, that also underpin some of the segregation in cities. And, and we see some, some quite stark views being articulated around ethnic difference, around class difference, and people not wanting to share rights with particular fellow travelers. There are questions about data generation and use. On the driver's side, there are questions about where they can access customers, about how these customers interact with them, questions about earnings, and again, questions about data. There are also questions about what all of this means for other mobility services, in particular, public transport. And if we're talking about shared bikes and e-scooters, there are questions about how this impacts the wider streetscape. Back to the UK back to Mobike, who were um, active in quite a few UK cities, including in Oxford, where, the, um, where they actually caused quite a bit of resistance among various local publics. And people were particularly appalled by these bikes ending up everywhere on pavements. And there were some very legitimate concerns because for people with a disability, visual disability in particular, they sort of really, uh, well, yeah, had to negotiate pavements that all of a sudden had become quite a bit more, um, quite a bit more complex. And after an initial sort of push for bringing as many bikes into these cities, including in Oxford, these companies started to rationalize their services uh, and use various geofencing techniques. Again, you see Oxford, within the ring roads and the, the zone in blue is the, the area where at, at some point you are only allowed to use the, the mobikes, um, which is in the city centre and the areas frequented by students in particular. Part of this move was to reduce losses and the lack of willingness for mobike as an operator to provide the staff who would move around the bike, so the redistribution. So this was effectively a digital fix for, to, to keep overhead costs as low as possible. So you see concentration on areas where the probability of profitability is high, which are the central areas where many alternatives are already available, also for students. So uneven landscapes of accessibility within the city, the micro geographies of uneven accessibility in the city only became more articulated. You see something similar in other cities. A student who I supervise in Oxford is looking at Mobike and similar operators in the city of Shenzhen, where particularly in the suburbs, we see a stark concentration of the parking zones for these bikes close to metro stops, which is great on the one hand because it means first mile, last mile traffic. But it also means that at places where accessibility is already quite high, it only becomes higher and this is driven by local policy makers and a framework for performance evaluation of these operators and subsequent assignment of future contracts 
that sort of says, okay, you need to, you, you get incentivized as, as an operator for uh, providing your parking close to public transport. So there is an institutional drive towards concentrating these bikes and these services in locations that already have quite good accessibility. In the UK context, we can say that Mobike, Mobike lacked an understanding of the desires and needs of customers. And um, as, as Jeff Dudley and David Bannister and, and, I, and I wrote in a paper from a couple of years ago, it was the public reaction rather than the innovation itself that made it disruptive. And the lack of intervention by the public authorities did not make things better. And again, there was a very stark, strong campaign by the local newspaper against these bikes. And that sort of really mobilized and generated publics and, and public resistance against this uh, innovation. So if we think a little bit further about the issue uh, about this, we can, we can identify a number of issues where justice becomes a concern. And what I've tried to do here and also in the next diagram. It's trying to bring together two different literatures, that on transport and mobility justice and that on digital justice, uh, sorry, data justice. There's a new literature in interdisciplinary social sciences that uh, where questions of, uh, of, of justice in relation to digital data and digital technologies is being, being developed. And uh, what I've tried to do here is sort of create this there's this space which sort of ra ranges from digital to the more physical side of, uh, of, of, of the issues we're looking at and sort of try to identify all the issues. I don't have time to go into them individually, but you can see that I've tried to sort of bring in this, this emphasis on distribution, on procedure and recognition. And some of the issues I've identified sort of are a mixture of these. Um, but if we, if we do that for bike sharing, it might look like this. If we do it for ride sharing, it begins to look like this because I think we need a different, a, a second axis added to the diagram that looks at the user side, but also the provider side and, and the, the, the employment side of things. So again, quite a few issues that emerge. Uh, there's a clear cluster of uh, questions around distribution, which is about um, access and affordability, but also about the fairness in the assignment algorithms and the question of rating. There are some very interesting studies that come out recently where both drivers and, um, and, and passengers rate each other and rate each other differently on the basis of race. There's some, some studies in the US that I've seen that have done that. So again, we kind of see wider inequalities being built into how these systems operate. But there's also broader questions around data use, about how people get represented in data, how people have rights to data, and how people actually understand what is happening with these data and, and what they would value in all of this. So questions of value and capability come in place here as well. So quite a lot to work through and I'm currently sort of writing a piece that is with others that is looking at these kinds of issues and I think there's, there's quite a bit of scope for exploring this further. The next stage actually is to look at what this means for mobility as a service which goes one step further because it brings together multiple of these services. So to conclude things I think I've hoped to have made clear that platformization comes in many shapes and sizes. You probably already knew that, but also it's sort of the story of the rapid expansion. And I think the Grab story is a really interesting one. And it's a bit of a tweak to the more common story of Uber and other sort of global north companies that we, we, we all know. Questions of justice emerge on the side not only of the users, but also on the side of the workers. And if we want to make sense of those, we need to put the thinking on mobility justice in dialogue with that on data justice, as so often 
with transport. We cannot understand what's going on in transport with looking only at transport. We need to sort of bring in other insights, other disciplines, and look at this in a very interdisciplinary manner. Thank you very much for your attention, and that's the end of the lecture. Tanwa. <laughs>